Hello, everybody. Welcome to the PCR Valves 2020. I'm Victoria Delgado from the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and I have the pleasure to moderate this session sponsored by Edwards Life Science. The title is Echocardiography and the Role and Limitations in Measuring Valve Function. As my disclosures, besides these disclosures, I'm also echocardiographer and not that much interventionalist. And in this session, we have an excellent panel that will explain us the difference between echocardiography, echocardiography and invasive measurements of uh, the aortic valve once we have implanted transcatheter aortic valve. So we all know when we have a patient with uh, severe aortic stenosis, uh, the way we measure with echocardiography. And the way we measure with echocardiography is mainly based on velocities while with catheterization, we measure instantaneous pressures. So then we can always have a, slightly, a slight difference, but mainly when we have a severe aortic stenosis, this difference is not that, that much, much pronounced. However, when we have a, a change of the aortic valve, we can see, depending on the size of the valve, that with echocardiography, the gradients may be still higher that we what is what we would expect and if we do a catheterization maybe we can see a normal gradient or not that much difference. So in this session we have an excellent panel that will explain us the differences between echocardiography and invasive measurements, the implications of these differences, what we can expect and we will be familiar then with um, entities such as patient prosthesis mismatch and what do we need to do in order to provide best care for our patients. We have Dr. Phil McCarthy, McCarthy from the King's College Hospital in London who will speak about the relationship between echo-derived valve performance and clinical outcomes. We have also Dr. Didi Wang from Henry Ford Hospital at Detroit in US. She's a echocardiographer and guiding also interventions and she will explain us why is there a discordance between echo derived aortic valve gradients and invasive direct pressure gradients and we have also Dr. David Wood from St. Paul's and Vancouver General Hospital in Canada who will speak about how should echo be used to monitor the valve performance both in the acute settings and the long terms. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Phil McCarthy and his talk, what is the relationship between echo-derived valve performance and clinical outcomes? Phil, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Victoria, for that introduction. Uh, I think it's my role here to set the scene by talking about whether echo-derived gradients actually correlate with clinical outcomes. And I think my presentation will raise some interesting questions and hopefully stimulate some discussion throughout. So what I'm finding quite an interesting area. Here are my conflicts of interest. Now my, my first disclaimer is that I'm a structural interventional cardiologist. I'm not pretending to be an echo specialist. Uh, we've got lots of echo expertise on this symposium. But I do base a lot of very important clinical decisions on echo parameters that I've always thought I understood until I started looking into uh, some of these topics that we're going to be discussing today. The first question I want to ask is, are echo-derived gradients important after TAVI? And certainly we're brought up in a culture where we, we're taught that they are, both acutely and in the longer term. And the VARC definitions implies that they are. But is there clinical data to support this specifically after TAVI rather than surgical AVR? The VARC2 definition states quite clearly that a single absolute mean gradient above 20 millimeters of mercury is considered prosthetic valve dysfunction or mild um, prosthetic valve dysfunction, mild stenosis. And if we look at the VARC3 definition of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, you can see uh, highlighted in red there that an increase in mean gradient of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury or a final grad gradient of greater than 20, classifies as moderate hemodynamic structural valve deterioration. So it would certainly seem from these august definitions that we need to be really 
concerned about gradient, but what, what about acutely? What about the gradient that we get when we first deploy uh, the valve? Is there something special about a raised gradient or this value of a mean of 20 millimeters of mercury after TAVI valve deployment? This is data uh, which is really interesting data and very, very robust data presented a few weeks ago at uh, TCT by Eng and colleagues, looking at the TVT registry. And these are absolutely massive numbers of patients, over 140,000 patients, looking at those patients who had a mean gradient greater than 20 after TAVI uh, using the, the Edwards valve, compared with those patients that are mean gradient of less than 20. And quite surprisingly, the patients with the greater gradient seem to do better. You can see the all-cause mortality is higher, uh, significantly so, in those patients with a lower gradient, which is, is, is quite strange. And this is backed up by another study also presented at, uh, at um, TCT a few weeks ago, again with good numbers of patients. And you can see that the discharge mean gradient of less than 20 uh, group, which is the blue, seem to have um, uh, you know, better survival, uh, sorry, the greater gradients have better survival than the lower gradients. So the blue is the, the patients with the lower gradients. So this is in, in contradiction to what we would normally think about gradients after valve deployment. And if you look at a group of patients that traditionally have higher gradients, such as the valve in valve population, the same sort of thing happens. There seems to be a disconnect between the gradient that we get after deployment of the TAVI valve and survival. And this is quite a, a, an august registry now involving more than a thousand patients. And you can see followed out to eight years, those patients with a higher gradient, greater than 20, after valve deployment within the bioprosthetic surgical valve do just as well in terms of their survival. Let's look at other patients that seem to have uh, high gradients. So these are patients with uh, small annually. Uh, you can see that this is uh, going back to the end data, looking at patients with a 20 millimeter valve compared to all the rest. And the mean gradient is, is a little higher in this group uh, than the larger valve size. And also the echo derived patient prosthesis mismatch is a higher proportion of these patients. Yeah, their survival to 12 months is exactly the same. So the changes in gradients in the smaller annulus population does not translate to clinical outcomes in this data. So what about different TAVI devices? Now, we know that different devices give us different gradients, and we've known that for a long, long time. Does, does this different hemodynamic outcome translate to uh, clinical benefit? Let's look at the data here. This is data from the um, Japanese Ocean TAVI registry. And this was a, a very large registry. And this particular study was looking at patients with small annulus size, which is the group on the left, and super small annulus size, which is the group on the right, and comparing the sapien with the other valve that was used in this registry, the Evolute. And, and you can see that the EOA, the effective orifice area, uh, is slightly lower in the sapien, and the mean gradient is slightly higher. Um, and yet, if we look at the survival, the survival in, in the right hand side when the, the, the sapiens compared to the evolute is better with the sapien valve. And, and so, in fact, to the tune of, of almost double in this particular data set, you can see that the, the, the um, mortality on the lower chart there with the evolute is 17.8 compared to 8.7, despite what you would think to be adverse hemodynamics when the valves first went in. What about more data comparing valves? Well, this is the Portico uh, ID randomized control trial, again, published a few weeks ago, um, comparing Portico with a similar self-expanding valve, the Evolute, and also comparing Portico on the right with the Sapien. The hemodynamics between the Portico and the Evolute are pretty similar in terms of the EOA and the mean gradient. The hemodynamics with the Sapien appear to be slightly disadvantageous in that the Sapien has a slightly lower effective orifice area and a slightly higher gradient. Yet despite that, there is no correlation with outcomes. The uh, mortality at two years is similar between the portico and the evolute, uh, and the mortality is better with the sapien valve 
than the portico, despite this hemodynamic data, both early and late. So what about uh, surgical valves? If we look at the comparison between TAVI valves and surgical valves, can we gain some insights from looking at the surgical data? Well, if we start with a notion randomized control trial with Lars Sondergaard and colleagues, you can see that uh, as you perhaps would expect, the effective orifice area is higher with the TAVI valves and the surgical valves and the mean gradient is higher with the surgical valves, yet the survival out to five years uh, is the same. Again, discordant with the hemodynamics. Some more surgical data is presented here with the Evolute low risk trial. Again, comparing surgery this time with the Evolute valve. The, the Evolute valve gives slightly better hemodynamics. Um, you can see that the EOA is slightly higher with the TAVA group and the um, mean gradient slightly lower. And yet the uh, survival out to 24 months, again, the same shown here with the red circles. And if we look at part the three data, you can see that actually the, the surgeon did really well in part three and the mean grading with surgery was, was lower, um, out right out to two years, but the survival we all know uh, was better with the uh, TAVI group. So again, it didn't correlate and there was this discordance between he hemodynamics and clinical outcomes. If we look at patient prosthesis mismatch, certainly we, we're all taught to uh, fear patient prosthesis mismatch. We're all taught that patient prosthesis, patient prosthesis mismatch is a really bad thing and we do our very best uh, to avoid it. And in the surgical literature, this is backed up with good data, but does the same rule apply to the TAVI population? In other words, does PPM confer the poor prognosis in our TAVI patients? Let's look at um, the partner trial, some of the surgical data versus the, the TAVI data. If you look at the top graphs, you see what you would expect to see. In other words, if there is no PPM, patients do better. And in fact, if you divide up the PPM into none, moderate and severe, the patient group splits as you would expect to see. But if you look at the TAVI population, it's the wrong way around. Patients with no PPM appear to have a higher mortality, although that doesn't reach statistical significance. And there doesn't seem to be a pattern if you divide up none, moderate and severe PPM. So that's another curious finding. Let's look at partner two, the S3I study. And this was PPM defined by ECHO, but also in a better way by CT. Some people say looking at CT to examine the LVOT and try to get a better definition of of PPM. Again, again, there doesn't appear to be a relationship between PPM and survival. And in fact, if you look at the graph on the right, the, the group that appeared to do the best and had the, have the lowest death rate are the, the patients with a defined severe PPM by CT definitions. Going back to the N large TVT um, registry data, those patients with severe PPM after TAVI survived out to 12 months with exactly the same rate as those without severe PPM. And these are good numbers. You look at the numbers on the bottom. And the same thing is shown by the ABBAS um, data set. If you define um, PPM immediately after or at, at the time of discharge, those patients with severe discharge PPM had the same accumulative survival to 24 months as those without. So this data is certainly stimulating and, and uh, as yet, I think, unex unexplained. I think we can conclude that elevated gradients have been assumed to correlate with a poor procedural outcome, and that has been ingrained in our, in our practice. But the elevated echo-derived mean gradient after TAVI implantation doesn't appear to be correlated with the clinical outcome, even in groups of patients that traditionally have quite high gradients, like the valve and valve population. A higher rate of echo-defined PPM in smaller valves doesn't appear to correlate with clinical outcome. And the differences in these hemodynamics with different TAVI devices, again, don't correlate with differences in clinical outcomes with those devices. And no matter how you define patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, this does not appear to correlate with outcome in the TAVI population. So some, some, some really interesting data that I 
can't explain, and I think my, my colleagues on this symposium will be able to explain better, but certainly worthy of further thought and indeed further study. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Phil, for this excellent talk. And now we continue with another exciting talk by Dr. Didi Wan, interventional imager, who will speak about the concordance or discordance between eco-derived and invasive uh, direct pressure gradients. Didi. Thank you very much for the kind introductions, Victoria. Um, we're going to go over concordance or discordance between echo and CAS, and these are my disclosures. Uh, the relevant disclosure is I do echo and CT and I use to CAS, but in the next 10 minutes, we're going to define three main goals. What echo really measures and identify what the meaning of radiance is, then reevaluate do we have the right terms for tablet technologies. So we have to understand, first of all, that echo is a hardware and what it measures is different than what the software that it's actually using calculates. What do I mean by this is that echo does not measure gradients as Phil has, um, has shown already. The most important part in this video is I show you that I'm actually showing how to calculate a gradient and the software will actually measure something, report something. If you look closely at my cursor in the bottom of the screen, I'm tracing blackness or nothing that has actually blood flow in there, but the echo software is still giving me a gradient and a velocity. So echo doesn't actually measure anything. It's actually showing you what you want to do at a point in time and giving you a calculated de derived software measurement. The other important part is that echo is actually being confused with cath. We're using the term gradients, but there's differences in measurements and echo is actually capturing turbulence. Turbulence as in a velocity or a blood flow. The importance of this is actually in understanding what goes into the Bernoulli equation or P is equal to four times velocity squared. On my left box, CAS actually measures pressure. And I would like to propose to our group that maybe we shouldn't use the term gradients anymore. Pressure in CAS is a measure of force applied to an area. So if I have a stenotic valve, how much force do I need to push that pigtail catheter across to get a gradient? Echo is velocity or you know, meters per second over moving distance. How this applies clinically is that if we're looking at why this is the case, this is exactly why CAS can always have a gradient of quote zero. And we always zero the CAS pigtail catheters from the LV and the aorta when we're doing our pullback too. If you think about it, we've never actually had a situation where echo reports a final report of zero because on my far left image, when I'm showing you a four chamber view of the heart or five chamber view of the heart, the dotted lines that's um, highlighted in the yellow is actually the velocity in centimeters per second, a moving particle over time. And we calculate that velocity. So as long as the heart's alive, you will not get a final report of zero millimeters of mercury ever on echo. So the gradients don't mean anything. It's a velocity versus pressure phenomenon. This is where you can see we never look at the centimeters per second on the echo part or the echo report too. How this applies is there is only one or two situations where echo and cath will both equal zero. The number one frustration in the cath lab from my implanters is, well, I'm getting a gradient of zero across my valve. Why are you reporting something? And the only time we will agree is when there's number one on the left, no cardiac motion, and we're doing about to start CPR. And number two on the right, when we're in complete heart block, when there's no cardiac motion. The pigtail catheter, if we would put it in there, would be zero. And my echo will have no velocity because there's no cardiac contractility or function. So that's the only time we'll actually both get the zero. But moving forward, what else do we have? Well, there's also the design change in tablet technologies, which is intro versus super annular design. On my far left is a Sapien 3, and my far right is a frozen leaflet with a core valve. On my far left, you can see that the distance traveled from the annulus, which is in the horizontal bar, to the yellow line and the red distance is actually going to be copy and pasted to the one on the right, which is the core valve. And you can see that in the blue trapezoid box, there's a greater distance than needs to be traveled by the blood flow for the echo to be measuring any velocities in the superannular design than on the far left on a sapient design. So with the presence of a skirt and where the leaflets are inserted at, we get the velocity point point faster than the far right where there's more time for the actual blood flow to dissipate. That dissipation of blood flow to where the leaflets are in a superannular design will actually delay when we will also see accelerations in velocities too. How this actually shows up on the echo on the far left image, as you can see on the Sapien 3, in the yellow arrow, we show you the turbulence or where there's a rainbow color of the aliasing velocity occurs at the skirt. On my far right in the frozen leaflet with the core valve, the super air design, you can see that the actual turbulence is actually more aortic or more super annular and where the green ellipse is actually shown. So a less turbulent flow will be lower velocities, which is then lower calculated gradients. But as Phil had eloquently shown before, it doesn't actually have any long-term uh, outcomes. 
This is what it looks like on CT if you have a difficulty seeing on echo. In the yellow arrow, we're showing you the frozen leaflets. In the green crossbar is actually where the native aortic annulus as, is at. So you can see the significant distance between the frozen leaflets when the annulus is at, and that's why the difference is in the pressure gradients and the calculator derived gradients too. So the echo mechanics is number three. It's a problem that we have. We're using the term gradients, but it also depends on where we measure. And we can measure an echo as a distance over time everywhere in the left ventricle to out the aorta, whatever is along that straight line. And that turbulence is actually what we're reflecting as we have shown you. So that goes back to definitions. Are we actually using the right definitions for actually using gradients? Maybe we should just let echo be echo because echo is actually trying to teach us something and it's not just valvular. And we are so fixated on the valve, we've forgotten about the structural heart disease. One of the things that we always do in the echo report is we had to repeat, uh, actually show what the TVT registry registries want us to report. When we show a registry information, we don't give you a whole picture of the heart. On the far left, this patient is post-core valve implantation. They had a velocity of almost five meters per second and a peak gradient of almost 98.7 millimeters of mercury. But if you take a look at this, the echo report says high gradient, cast at low. Well, the valve, the core valve is functioning fine. We can see leaflets moving fine. This is actually a Hochman physiology. But on my registry, I cannot report that. There's no blank for other for that high velocity. And there's no ability for us to actually show these images when we're reporting the outcomes, because if you click on this video, what you're going to actually see is the actual velocity of flow acceleration is not actually happening at the tabular valve. It would actually be happening at the basal anterior septal wall, the LV, where the Hocum phenomenon is coming with the SAM. So what does this mean for tabular technologies and the term PPM or patient prosthesis mismatch? Um, it's a very confusing term for me. And we really need to standardize what PPM is. If I was to Google PPM, and I Googled it, PPM meaning in cardiology in top right-hand corner, and PPM meaning in cardiac surgery bottom right-hand corner, number one thing I get is out of 400,000 hits, permanent pacemaker, permanent pacemaker implantation. So since when do we use PPM for patient prosthesis mismatch? And I can't find that in the top three hits on Google. But we're using that term very loosely across all registries and across tavern outcomes. And maybe we should think about, is that the right term that we're actually using? So if we're talking about prosthesis mismatch, going back to the history of prosthesis mismatch in 1978, it actually meant an undersized surgical aortic valve in a normal aortic root annulus, something that was surgically manipulated. And that is on the far right-hand image, you can see a normal aorta, but in purple is actually the small surgical valve that was implanted and sutured in. And in the actual yellow uh, column is what the actual native aortic annulus size needed to be. The other phenomenon is when you have a homograft implantation and your root implantation, a complete root removal and undersizing gives you an artificial aorta. That's also a patient prosthesis mismatch. But somehow in the evolution of the term prosthesis patient mismatch from surgery, we've gone to a stent technology in the far right, and we've gone the wrong way with evolution, and we're calling it for tablet technologies. The question is, well, we have registry reports for outcomes, and the registry shows that when there's smaller valve and valve procedures or smaller valve, we have higher velocities. And while higher velocities will equate to the term PPM, but does that really show long-term outcomes? And Philip McCarthy already eloquently showed these slides already, that we don't see any kind of failed surgical outcomes at eight years in time with these gradients that were being reported. But it comes back to the concept that maybe we're not reporting what we actually understand because the velocity equations for Bernoulli and for continuity all take the velocity and square it and give you a calculation derived without actually giving you the structural abnormalities that are present in these patients. The other problem with PPM is that when we talk about it, we assume the annulus is actually circular. And Jonathan Leipzig eloquently in 2017 showed this LVOT diameter for actual using calculation of PPM. Effective orifice area is actually decreased by half when you actually see that the CT measurement of the LVOT is an ellipsoid shape, not truly an actual circular circle. So in conclusion, to think about this in PPM, maybe we should think about this. Is your PPM and TAVR in a native aortic annulus? Because the aorta is just a tube, a coronary blood vessel like the left main is just a tube. Do we ever call a left main stent having PPM? So if TAVR technology is built upon a stent and a stent is putting in a tube, are we calling it a PPM in a left main stent now into a TAVR? Because actually it's quite organic compared to all the surgical valves we're actually putting into an aortic annulus. And this is what patient prosthesis mismatch was in 1978. On the far right, we're now discovering stent turbulence and structural heart disease. So this is the thing that we're seeing, turbulence and velocities equals to higher uh, calculated gradients, whereas we're not considering the stent technology, struts, or skirt uh, formulations too.
And we're also not accounting for changes in the aortic outflow tract, the way the aorta actually changes in angulations, LV contours, based with anteroceptal wall abnormalities. We're oversimplifying a technology that's actually quite complex. So in summary, maybe there's a discordance because we're not understanding turbulence. PPM does exist in surgical aortic valve replacements, but TAVR is really just a stent. We really do need to understand, are we using the term PPM correctly? Is it really a pacemaker or something else? An echo does not measure gradients, nor was it intended to. It was actually to show us structural heart disease. The current formulas are actually just a tool for us, not a substitute for doing further evaluation. And we really need to learn more our imaging toolkits. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Didi. That was a great talk. And now it's my pleasure to introduce David Booth from Vancouver, and he will speak about echocardiography and invasive hemodynamics for monitoring acute and long-term valve performance, and he will speak about a new paradigm. Looking forward to hear your talk, David. Victoria, thank you so much. And Philip, Didi, this has been an absolutely wonderful session. We are now gonna take it back to three case examples. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Janara Sadhanathan, and I know it sounds lofty, a new paradigm, but we're just trying to understand how to incorporate these concepts into patient care. Our disclosures. So uh, two weeks ago on a Friday, routine and uh, quotes there, Tavi Day in Vancouver, we were using a next generation valve. Uh, we had the engineers Skyping in from Irvine and um, we got that on the table gradient, which we now know, DD, perhaps we shouldn't be using that word. And the question was whether we should post-dilate, um, whether the engineers should go back to their drawing board, uh, what should be the next steps. And we did very um, detailed standardized invasive hemodynamics and got a mean gradient of four. So we took the patient off the table. The engineers were very happy. We were very happy. But this absolutely highlighted um, that our echo-derived gradients are influencing clinical decisions. So in the next nine minutes, we'll kind of go through the background and then end with two cases that we think this idea of standardized invasive hemodynamics have changed patient management. I'll turn over to my friend and colleague, Janar Sadhanathan. Janar. Thank you, David. So I think this case in this next generation valve highlights a, a concept that's already been highlighted by Dr. Wang and that there's a, a discordance between the measurements that we gain using echocardiography and those gradients that we gain using invasive hemodynamics and relates to fundamental differences in how these measurements are obtained. Now, this concept has been gaining attention in recent years, and this is one series from Dr. Abbas and a prospective series looking at this discordance acutely following TAVR. And what you can see is that in as much as half of patients, there's discordance by as much as five millimeters of mercury and in 10% of patients by as much as 10 millimeters of mercury with lower gradients observed using invasive hemodynamics compared to echocardiography. Now, when you're looking at any measurement, the way that we obtain this is critical and making sure that the measurement is accurate is absolutely paramount. Now, this is one method that you could consider using, which is utilizing a pigtail in the left ventricle and using the large bore sheath for your second transducer. This is an approach that we've trialed in Vancouver. However, we found that there's been disparities in the gradients between these two transducers by as much as eight millimeters of mercury. It is also not an approach that you can reproducibly do it in a patient at long-term follow-up. So technique, again, I just wanna stress this point has important implications. As interventionists, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and that when you look at across a variety of different cat labs, leveling and zeroing is considerably variable across cath labs. It is not a homogenous approach and it's not a standardized approach. And that can lead to variations in the measurements you obtain. We know from our colleagues that look after pulmonary vascular disease that these measurements are critical for decision-making as it relates to patient care. And simple things such as changes in the position of the transducer can lead to differences in up to eight millimeters of mercury. So in Vancouver, we've been developing an approach that we hope will result in invasive hemodynamics that are both reliable and reproducible and accurate, which David is gonna take through with you now. Thank you, Janar. This is so seamless, I love it. Um, so this is our, what we call standard approach for transcatheter or any um, bioprosthetic valve assessment. 
we start, there's six steps. One, computed CT-derived aortic valve height. Very easy, coronal plane, sagittal plane, crosshairs. You measure from where the patient is lying on the table to the mid portion of the aortic valve. You then, you then move to your table-mounted transducers. I cannot stress how important that is. And you set it to the CT-derived aortic valve height, whether that's 15 centimeters, 18 centimeters, and you measure from the top of the pad so it's consistent from the patient on the cath lab to the patient in the CT scanner. Both manifolds are flushed with saline and zeroed at the same level as the transducers. And this is key. After you've done the TAVI, any platform, the two pigtails are positioned two centimeters above the valve, the distance of the basket, and you are then going to uh, assess for quality and discordance. Those need to be within one millimeter of mercury. You then advance one pigtail across the valve, position it two centimeters below, as you can see in that lower frame, and pressure and uh, mean gradients are obtained. Final check, pullback of that LV pigtail to two centimeters above the valve, we call it the kissing pigtail technique, uh, to check to make sure again, we are within one millimeter of mercury. I cannot tell you how much this has impacted both our faith in our measurements, as well as in um, how we are managing selected patients. Again, the idea that it's a, um, it's a paradigm shift might be a little bit much. So what are the practical implications? We know ECHO is used to assess acute and long-term valve performance. We know it's not just gradient. We're talking about EOA, DVI. Many centers no longer perform on table echo at the time of TAVI, although most would do it before discharge. Some centers perform, and then this is key, non-standardized invasive hemodynamics immediately pre and post TAVI. All these measurements is rarely guide clinical care. They've just been obtained kind of as a historical piece. The question is how would standardized invasive hemodynamics change acute and long-term management? And I think this is absolutely key as we move forward. So a new algorithm for long-term THP follow-up, and I am very keen to get the opinion here of Victoria, Didi, Philip. You have an elevated gradient on echo, and let's be honest, most heart teams, that's what they're looking at when they're reviewing patients long-term. You see a moderate or a severe increase in that gradient, increase of 10, increase of 20, absolute greater than 20 or 30. Then we start wondering, is there valve thrombosis? Halt, what's happening with that valve? we get the cardiac CT scan. If there's valve thrombosis, anticoagulation. But if there's no valve thrombosis, what we're now advocating is standardized invasive hemodynamics. And we're gonna get into that in two cases with Janara in just a moment, because we do believe this can provide some reassurance and can help guide clinical decision-making. Obviously, if we bring the patient back, do our standardized invasive hemodynamics and see the gradients elevated, maybe we're gonna talk about a re-intervention, maybe bringing the patient back to redilate. Perhaps in the worst scenario, if the symptoms and the clinical circumstances dictate uh, a valve and valve. But if there's discordance, we would argue no intervention is needed. And this is the crucial piece. So I'm going to turn it back to Janar for two, I think, very um, compelling cases. Thank you, David. So I'm just going to take you through just an example of how um, this algorithm has been used in our center to help influence patient uh, care and decision making for these patients, both at early follow-up and also at long-term follow-up. So this is a patient that's an 81-year-old gentleman who had a 26 millimeter sapien S3. The key point was that he was asymptomatic, but at one month follow-up, he had a gradient of 19 millimeters of mercury. His caring cardiologist was concerned because as Philip highlighted, we have this number fixated in our head that 20 is a metric that should be of concern. And so had a follow-up echo done at three months where the gradient rose to 24. And so was referred back to our transcatheter heart valve clinic because there was concern that the THV was not functioning appropriately. A CT was performed which excluded valve thrombosis, but because we had this discordance between the echo gradient and a patient that was asymptomatic, we did invasive gradients that showed that the gradient was only 15, which was reassuring, was consistent with how the patient was feeling, and we essentially, this patient just went back on to routine clinical follow-up uh, with the understanding that there was clearly some discordance between the measurements. The next case in somebody that is significantly younger is much more provocative and thought provoking in terms of the use of invasive hemodynamics. This is a patient that was 57 in 2017 and clearly at that age had a number of comorbidities for them to be turned down for surgery by our colleague Richard Cook. Uh, 
and was referred to the TAVI. And the most pertinent comorbidity was that of morbid obesity. He had a 26 millimeter S3 valve put in at that time. And over the space of three years, I'll just take you through these gradients. And again, while there's a number of other variables, many referring cardiologists and caring physicians use the gradient in clinical practice to monitor these patients. So at early follow-up, it was 16. Then at one year, it was nine. Then at two year and three year, it was elevated at 28 and 27, respectively. So the concern was here that this was a valve that was degenerating early and needed re-intervention. This patient was brought back and reassuringly, the invasive gradient was only 18. And so made a significant impact in terms of avoiding re-intervention. And this patient was put on to regular clinical follow-up. In conclusion, we believe that this standardized invasive approach has impacted clinical care. We agree ECHO will remain an important tool, but clinicians must be aware of this potential hemodynamic discordance and that standardized invasive hemodynamics will be crucial for both the acute and long-term assessment of valve performance. And we're very much looking forward to the discussion with this illustrious group because uh, we do believe this is a um, change in how we're managing patients in Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you very much, David and Jenner, for this excellent presentation and really exciting cases that I think that uh, together with the talks of uh, Phil and Didi are going to give us a very good discussion uh, about the concept of using gradients, using velocities, and maybe more checking structural problems that can lead to the hemodynamics that we are seeing in echocardiography and that may help us to understand what we are seeing on echocardiography and what we can expect during the invasive measurements. So with this, I would like to start asking Phil about the concept of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch and maybe also Didi because she also touched upon on patient prosthesis mismatch in her uh, talk. If we go back to the definition of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, that was an effective orifice area of a new valve. Uh, divided by the body surface area of the patient. But of course, in the calculation of the effective orifice area, we need to take into account the flow conditions of the patient. So if we have a patient, for example, that has a poor left ventricular systolic function, as many patients, for example, on TAVI, the flow may not improve and we may calculate an effective orifice area that is low. And if we uh, have a patient that is obese, like for example, the patient that David and Jenner um, uh, explain, then we may end up with an erroneous concept of patient prosthesis mismatch. So do you expect that uh, the echocardiographer, for example, uh, gives in the, in the um, report of the echo information about patient prosthesis mismatch? Or do you think that it's better to forget about calculations of effective orifice area and gradients and go more to the concept of velocity that Didi was uh, indicating in her talk. What do you think, Phil? I think that, that um, it's about the definitions that we're, we're looking at here. And th there's no question that if you put in a small valve, it's not going to be good for the patient. So my interpretation of all of this is that it's getting the definition right. And I think maybe we need our echo and imaging colleagues just to give us the data and to tell us what that data means, rather than trying to get too um, complex and to make too many assumptions, maybe we should just be looking at the velocity and, 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 and learn how to interpret the velocity and have our echo colleagues help us in, in interpreting the velocity, because the velocity is the velocity. Uh, you've made no assumptions, there's no equations, and you can then assimilate that data into all the other data that you, you use to make clinical decisions. I think the more calculations that we make and the more assumptions we make, the more confused we get. So the way that I interpret this is we are defining PPM incorrectly at the moment. And because I have no doubt if you put in a valve that causes an obstruction, how can that be good for the heart? It's a question of the definition of it. And I, and I think we need to maybe just use some more of the, the data with our with our imaging colleagues to try and make clinical decisions without making too many assumptions. Once you start assuming the LBOT is circular uh, and these kind of things, you get one, two, three steps away from the truth. Yeah, right. Didi, what's your opinion? I can't agree with Phil more. Um, I think he very eloquently in his talk illustrated the fact that 
um, it looks like higher gradients have uh, better outcomes for morbidity and mortality. And from my standpoint, it makes complete sense because I don't think about gradients like a cat interventionalist think about as gradients. I think we should go to the term velocities because if I think about velocities, that means in my interpretation, the patient has a more robust ejection fraction and their yeah. heart's pumping harder and they have better muscle present. And the person yeah. that has a bad EF, they're gonna not be able to generate a quote higher velocity or a quote gradient. And I think the term is being used wrong because if you think about this, as Victoria, you mentioned so well, with David's patient that was uh, morbid obesity, um, even if they're morbidly obese, natively, they were born that way with their aorta size. Yeah. Their aorta wasn't born undersized unless they were coarctation or bicuspid. So they were born organically with that size aorta. If I was to put a valve that was too small in there, it should embolize. But if I didn't embolize the valve, and I don't have severe PVL, and I have a functioning valve in there, something that doesn't make sense. And yeah. the patient lived with that already. So I think exactly. the definitions are actually very incorrect and there's a lot of misinformation. I hate to use that word in 2020 out there, <laughs> but I think there's an obligation for us as a group to really, you know, rattle the chains and say, hey, how should we standardize this? And I think David and Jannar have a very eloquent way of looking about standardizing CAT. And I think from the imaging community, we need to standardize our terms too. Um, PPM in my mind is still permanent pacemaker. I still need to understand what else we can call high velocities. <laughs> <laughs> That's very right. And for David and Jinnar, um, you uh, presented very uh, convincing the data of invasive measurements. And I think that that is a correct way to go when there are some conflicting data or when you don't understand what you are seeing on echocardiography, and particularly if it doesn't match with the symptoms of the patient or if the patient is asymptomatic, like the patient that you presented. So you said uh, this would be for selected patients, and I agree because it's an invasive measurement. But at the moment that you are implanting the valve, would you recommend to um, document there at that moment the invasive measurement and what corresponds to the velocity of the valve taken on echocardiography so that you have a sort of a standard of a baseline value to follow up that patient so that the uh, next echocardiography that is performed two years later, if it shows the same velocity, there is no doubt uh, that the, the valve is functioning well. So I think all of our uh, recent experience looking at standardized hemodynamic assessment with those six steps has taught us that just putting a pigtail across and transducing off the sheath or off another catheter really is not going to help you long term if your patient starts having increased velocities. I didn't use mean gradient there, Didi, uh, for whatever reason in the future. Um, so if you're going to do it, what we're trying to get out, and we've talked offline about getting a manuscript out hopefully quite quickly, um, we would suggest this standardized technique. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't take extra time, and all of us interventional structural cardiologists like to finish the case and move on to the next case. But this requires getting that <coughs> CT derived height, using the two pigtails, crossing, having them two centimeters above and below, coming back and doing a final check to make sure you're still within one millimeter of mercury. And to Didi's point, getting an accurate EDP at, right at the portion of the sigmoid septum there, two centimeters below the valve. I think if we do that, yes, then when we have these select cases, I'm not suggesting for all cases, although some have suggested maybe we should have a large substudy with incomplete TAVR. 4,000 patients, five-year follow-up that we hope to start enrolling in next month. I don't know if we're going to do that or not, but we definitely need to get some prospective data, both within bioprosthetic valves. We probably need to also look at this in native valves prior to transcatheter valve implantation. And then the last piece, which is incredibly confusing to Philip's point and all of that, would be um, in valve and valve. I don't know, Janar, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I just reiterate all those points. I mean, I think, again, the experience that we've learned here is that really doing the measurement accurately is the first point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I, I agree with you, Victoria, there's certainly benefit potentially at the time of TAVI to get those accurate invasive hemodynamics because it's just an additional step to do. Um, now, obviously, as David highlighted, it does add some time. But to Philip's point, I think the one thing that we're missing in all of this in terms of what terminology we want to call it velocities is that we're missing that link as to how it impacts patient outcomes. Um, you know, we've been kind of using mean gradient as this thing in VAC and two or three, whichever metric you're looking at, but 
how we correlate to the outcome of the patient is the big piece that we're missing. And I think that's what we have to work together as a community. So I think that, that's the key point. In that last case example, we showed the 57 year old, he's three years out, his gradient's up near 30. I have no doubt from doing benchmark all over the world, proctoring all over the world, <laughs> that there are places where that patient might have been brought back for a redilatation or might be even a valve and valve procedure. And I think we clearly showed with standardized hemodynamic assessment, that gradient was well below 20 and that his multifactorial NOHA class two was not from early valve dysfunction or PPM or any term you wanna use. And to me, it's all about the patient in the end. And if this tool is gonna to allow us to look at these selected patients, I think it needs to be on people's radar. Thanks. This is a very interesting discussion and I would stay here longer, but we have uh, time constraints. So I want to thank you all for your excellent presentations and all the learning uh, that we have uh, got. And I think that uh, one of the important message here is that once uh, you have a patient with a TAVI valve and you are follow up, following up the patient, check for the symptoms of the patient, check uh, for structural problems, try to get the uh, diagnosis accurate, and then proceed with the uh, treatment if needed. Because sometimes the numbers do not match with uh, what we see and do not have any correlation with uh, the outcomes of uh, the patient. So thank you very much to you all for your uh, presentations, your discussions, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Wonderful. Thank you.